Okay. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Gregory Sadler, um, and, and I hope you all enjoyed this evening's talk. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Sure. So uh, I'll just do my, my own introduction. Uh, my wife and I uh, are both from this area. Andy's in the back uh, getting all the tasting things ready. Um, we're back here in Wisconsin after being gone for about 20 years. Uh, she in New York and I all over the place and then in, in New York. So we're very happy to be back here in this area. Um, I'm a philosopher by training, but I branch out into a number of other things like you can see here, some, some culinary matters as well. And the talk that I'm going to give tonight is, um, you could say it's, it's within the field of gastronomy, uh, which means you know, sort of this, this history or study of what it is that we eat. And, and that's something I've become more and more interested in, not only because I like to eat, but because food plays such an important role in, in all of our life and culture. And, and uh, so there's a lot we can talk about with that. The, the specific thing that I'm going to focus on here is uh, this question about how many basic tastes or flavors do we actually sense? Because there's this, uh, you know, we learn this all in school, right? When they have the, the tongue chart and all the, the four tastes, that there's really only four tastes, and now they think there's perhaps a fifth taste of, of umami. Um, that's, that's, that's something that, that we at least think we know to be the case. And it's become something like an unquestioned dogma of, of late modern Western approaches, but there's an entire history there. Usually when you bring up the possibility of, of other tastes, um, people want to talk about Chinese or, or Indian cooking, and I'm not going to do that here. There's a great, and those are both great, uh, vast traditions, and there's too much to talk about in that, but we, we have time for Q&A at the end, so we could discuss that. What I'm interested in here is something that took place within our Western tradition, and it goes back all the way to ancient Greece. So this dominant four flavor perspective is actually a very recent development historically. Um, there's good reasons why it, it developed the way that it did, and we'll talk about that. But um, another approach that was predominant in the West through the early modern era gravitated around a larger number of tastes or, or flavors, um, sometimes eight, sometimes nine, sometimes more. So I'm going to talk about how that, that arose, and then we've got a lot of cool stuff for you to taste that has these kinds of flavors. And uh, Andy talked us into also having a kind of bonus thing at the very end that, that she'll lead you through, so I'm not going to tell you quite what, what we're doing with that yet. So the subjects of this, this talk, I'm going to start out by telling uh, the story very briefly about how I got interested in this question about the tastes. Uh, and then I'm going to jump into history. And I've got some handouts there for you, uh, some very basic things. And we'll talk about the story of, of basic flavors in the Greek-speaking world before this guy, Aristotle. And then I want to hit on Aristotle. And at that point, we'll talk about eight tastes, and we'll actually start tasting some, some things. So if you came here to get something to eat or you know, looking for something after dinner, <laughs> um, that, that'll be that component. And then I, perhaps while you're still tasting those things, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what Aristotle himself had to say about, about tastes and food that are that's kind of interesting stuff. And then we'll talk about a, a bit more uh, of history, how this, this notion that, that is coming mostly from Aristotle uh, ends up going throughout uh, Western medieval thought and even Islamic thought about food all the way to the modern era. And then um, we'll talk about where did the, the, the four flavors come from? Why did we hit on that in the 19th century and, and 20th century? Now, the way that I typically do my talks is um, uh, anytime you want to ask a question, make a comment, just go ahead and, and do it. I'm, I'm very good at getting back on track, uh, sort of like a, you know, an old horse that knows the trail. Um, you know, so, so if you have any questions or comments, you don't have to wait until the end for them. I'm happy to go off on tangents and come back. But we also do have some time uh, reserved for questions and answer at the end. So how did I get interested in this myself? Uh, totally by accident. Um, and as a matter of fact, it, it was sort of stumbling across things that I had seen uh, a number of times and never paid attention to. 
and then running into colleagues who had equally done the same thing, both in the culinary world and in the world of, of philosophy and ancient texts. So back in the 2000s, I, I was doing a lot of research focused on discussions of anger, which is another area of research of mine, and I was reading these people that we call the Church Fathers. And so the Church Fathers are these early Christian thinkers, you know, up until about the 8th century or so. Um, some of them are theologians, some are philosophers, some are what we just consider administrators. And one of them is this guy, John Damascene, or John of Damascus. And he has a book that's called The Exposition of the Orthodox Faith. So I was reading through that to see some stuff about anger. And he had a chapter in there titled On Sensation. And in it, he started talking about, you know, sight and hearing. And then when he got to discussing taste, he said, yeah, there's all these different flavors. And I was like, well, wait a second. And so, you know, we, we've got, you know, sweet, salty, bitter, and sour. We recognize those. And then he started talking about all these other ones. And he started talking about it in such a way that it would be uh, sort of like everyone would know this. And that kind of floored me. And then I just sort of, I, I didn't really follow up on that. I put that in the back of my head. Years later, uh, this would be in the early teens, right? Or it would be about 2012. I was giving a lecture at the Culinary Institute of America uh, having to do with the way in which we bring together sight and hearing and taste in what we call synesthetic perception. And I was reading through some Aristotle. I was reading Aristotle on the soul because I knew that was an important early text for that. And Aristotle was talking about there's eight tastes. And again, he said it sort of like everyone knows this. I was like, well, where did, how did we end up with four when these ancient people recognized eight? Is it, is it that we just sort of dropped them out of the picture? So I started following up on this. And when I, when I would talk with colleagues about this, I got two different kinds of responses. Um, from philosophers who are interested in Aristotle or interested in John Damascene, they just say, yeah, that's, that's just not very interesting. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting little digression. Maybe you can write a note about it, not, a, not an actual full article, but, but a note, you know, a short piece, because um, we're really interested in other topics. When I talked with culinary people, I often got blank stares. And the blank stares uh, came about because some of them were, you know, saying, look, there's only four tastes or maybe five uh, if we actually accept this umami thing. There's sort of a, a doctrine that was out there. Or they would immediately start talking about Indian and Chinese cooking in which there's a wide, wider range of flavors recognized. So nobody, as far as I could tell, until I started doing some, some you know, reading around in this, uh, at least the people that I was meeting knew anything about there being a Western tradition of, of many more tastes. So when I started looking into it, I noticed a number of references among ancient and medieval authors to a multiplicity of basic flavors. And I also noticed that this, this four taste uh, schema that we have is very, very recent. Um, this guy, Briat Severan, who's very important in, in the, the formation of gastronomy in the early 19th century, he doesn't talk about it. As a matter of fact, he says there's an infinity of flavors. So it's not just four, it's, it's too many to count, according to him. And at the same time, I also began to notice not only a kind of ignorance or lack of attentiveness to this, this history, but a almost misrepresentation of that history. And I, I give you a, a handout that's, that's an excerpt from Jonathan Lair's 2003 Proust was a neuroscientist. Um, I'm not going to like read through this whole thing, and you can do that at your leisure, but, but I, wanna, I, I highlighted a few things in here. So Lehrer is claiming that Democritus, who we don't have any text by, uh, had said that you know, shapes cause tastes. And, and we know that to be the case, because Aristotle tells us that, uh, another ancient author, uh, Theophrastus, says that, and they're saying this because they're criticizing the guy. Um, it, it fits in with what Democritus was saying. We don't know that Democritus thought there were four tastes. As a matter of fact, we have good evidence to think that there were more than four tastes being recognized. Lehrer goes on and he says, uh, Plato believed Democritus, totally implausible, because Plato and Democritus are at total opposite ends of the scale. And Plato um, wrote in the Timaeus that, that there were just four tastes. Now in the Timaeus, if you read it, there's seven tastes. And then he goes on and he says, uh, in the De Anima, which is Aristotle's text, the four primary tastes Aristotle described are the already classic sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. 
except that Aristotle talks about eight tastes there. <laughs> and then in another work talks about seven tastes because he says, well, there's a way in which you can kind of cram them together and get seven out of it because they really liked number, numbers of seven. And then he says, over the ensuing millennia, this ancient theory remained largely unquestioned, the ancient theory of four tastes. Now, why, why is um, Lehrer bringing this up? Because he wants to focus on the recent uh, discovery, which is a real uh, important discovery of this umami flavor profile. Um, and, but in order to do that, you don't have to pretend as if somehow the Western tradition was this monolithic, we've only got four tastes because Democritus said so, and we're always just going to keep on plowing away. Especially when we see that there was this whole history of other tastes uh, being, being represented. So um, I'm, I'm still in the, involved in, in research on this. I'm finding that like a lot of academic research, um, you guys are all familiar with the term rabbit hole, right? You start researching something and it just keeps going further and further down. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do with the research, but I, given the opportunity to give a talk uh, in which I could present some of this, I thought, yeah, this would, this would be kind of interesting. And then Andy had the great idea of, well, we'll do some tasting of the actual taste, so it's not just a, a rather dry academic gastronomical lecture, but, but something with a real uh, gustatory component. So um, let me talk now about the Greeks before Aristotle. So we're talking now about the 4th and 5th century BC. These are people, uh, at least the natural philosophers and the physicians, who were interested in, in food, not just to eat it, but to understand it. The, the physicians were interested in it because they thought that the tastes of things revealed how they would affect us. So they, they'd already recognized by that time that bitter things are probably bad for us, sweet things are probably wholesome. Uh, Hippocrates recognized that if things are too sweet, probably not good for us. And Hippocrates, um, is, he writes this book called On Ancient Medicine. So we usually think of Hippocrates as ancient medicine. He's writing about guys even before him. And he's saying, uh, these guys screwed things up. The doctors that we've got right now, they're quacks. Why are they quacks? Well, because they do all this speculation about the hot and the cold and the, the, uh, the dry and the wet. These are sort of basic principles for you know, the, the four elements theory. And they don't pay attention to the tastes themselves and what the tastes signify about the food. So he, he says, um, you know, the, the, we have to actually uh, focus on, on how they're mixed together. He says the tastes that are too concentrated, they're, you know, uh, overly bitter, overly salty, they're not good for us. This is stuff that, you know, we would probably say is, is, is accurate today. If all you're doing is eating super salty food, probably not good for your, your body, right? If you're uh, just drinking straight vinegar, that's probably not going to be good for you either, right? Uh, but Hippocrates was, was writing at a time when people were prescribing this sort of thing. And he's saying, don't do that anymore. Democritus, uh, who unfortunately we don't have any writings by, just uh, little fragments, um, he, we know from, from later writers that not only did he distinguish flavors, but that he attributes the sense properties to the shapes of the particles. Um, and it's unclear as to what flavors he did recognize, but we know that it wasn't just the four tastes. There were more on the, on the docket. Hippocrates, um, Hippocrates recognize at least six flavors. When we get to Plato, and that, that's on that, that handout as well, we have discussion of seven flavors, seven basic flavors that are irreducible to each other. In this book, The Timaeus, which Plato writes towards the end of his life, it's, it's considered a late dialogue, it's sort of a, uh, what we call a cosmology. He's trying to explain everything. You know, where did the world come from? Why are human beings the way they are? Um, you know, why does grass grow? All, all these sorts of things. In it, he talks about the tongue. And he says that different flavor, different particles affect our tongues in different ways, and they produce different tastes. The upshot for us is that he says there is this taste, and this taste, and this taste, and this taste. They're not all just the, the four tastes that we recognize. And um, it would be nice if we had other documents besides that. Unfortunately, cooks didn't write much in that time. <laughs> Cooking was, was sort of a lower class activity, you know, the sort of thing you, you might have your, your slaves doing for you. It was not something that the people who were writing treatises would, would, would do. Um, so it's mostly medical writers and philosophers up, up until that point. Then we get Aristotle. Now Aristotle is an interesting guy in part because not only is he Plato's student, 
So he's in this lineage, uh, but he's also in the right place at the right time. He, he's in Athens. Um, he, he lived in a couple other places as well, um, but he's in Athens at the time that Athens uh, is, has been brought under the Macedonian hegemony. Um, you think of it as like a big empire being established. There's lots of flows of communication, access to everybody else's writings. Aristotle is, is also a guy who is what we call a polymath. He's interested in everything. He writes about pretty much all the domains of science available at, his, at, at, at that time, and he comes from a family of doctors, from a family of physicians. So he's already attuned to thinking about the human body and about what you give people. We see a lot of references to medicine in his works. He didn't follow along being a doctor uh, in, in his, his father's footsteps, but he became a philosopher instead. And he, uh, he does tell us something interesting about the culinary arts. Uh, as opposed to somebody like Plato, this is a little bit of a side note, Plato thought that, that cookery is a bad thing. Plato thought that cookery is sort of the, the, you know, what you get when you take medicine and you take all the knowledge out of it and you turn it into something like a, a capacity to flatter. He calls cookery a type of flattery, flattering the tongue, right? Medicine was good for you, cookery is bad for you. He also said that about, you know, rhetoric as opposed to other things. Rhetoric is, is, is like cookery. Uh, it's, it's a kind of flattery. You're just flattering the crowd, getting them to buy things. So think about it, you know, if you give kids, if we have kids, right? Uh, give them candy or give them healthy food, which do they prefer most of the time? Yeah, the candy, right? Uh, the healthy food is a bit of a hard sell. Uh, same thing with adults. That's why we have a lot of the problems that we do, you know. Uh, you have to work quite hard to make healthy food interesting and, and tasty. Um, Plato was, was pretty down on, on cookery. Aristotle thought of it as an art whose purpose was to produce pleasure, which is not a bad thing. It's not the best thing in the world. I mean, knowledge is better, virtue is better, uh, social harmony, those sort of things. But, you know, pleasure is not a bad thing. And so Aristotle was willing to, to think a bit more about this than Plato had. Now, he's got discussions of flavor, and they show up in several different works, one of which is called the, the De Anima, or On the Soul, the Peripsukes in, in Greek. And in that, he, he distinguishes eight tastes. In another work, uh, and I give you this on, on that, that other handout, um, on sense and the sensible, he tries to reduce it to seven tastes, basically because he likes the idea of there being seven. The way that he does it is he says, well, two of these tastes can really be sort of like assimilated to each other. So there are really eight tastes. He's just kind of making it fit the, the, the schema. And then he's got another book called The Physical Problems, uh, which don't actually turn out to be physical problems. Uh, there, some of them are. Some of them are psychological uh, things that he's investigating. And he's got all these sort of you know, musings about, I wonder what happens, you know, why is it that when we eat acorns and then we drink wine, the wine appears sweeter? The questions like that. He's interested in these sorts of things. So he is, is, is working through tastes, and he distinguished eight basic flavors. Um, like I've put on the handout for you, there's the sweet at one extreme, and then there's the bitter at another extreme. And he says, very close to these are the oily or the fatty, or the liparon. It can be translated in a number of ways. Uh, and then the salty. He says the salty is sort of like a type of bitterness. And then we've got these other four in between. And you recognize two of them, right? Or, or you know, you recognize one of them, the, the sour. But then he talks about the astringent and the pungent, and this one that's hard to translate, that we, we usually translate as the, the rough, the, um, where is that, the uh, austeron. We get the word austere from that. <laughs> and um, he gives us a few examples. Some later Aristotelians give us other examples that, that we can use. And that's what we're going to have you taste now. So now is the time for the, the uh, big tasting component of, of this talk. So while Andy and, and uh, my daughter, Catherine, are getting all the, the things together for you, um, I think what I'll do is while they're getting everything out, I'll tell you, I'll go through the other things about um, Aristotle and, uh, does that work, Andy? That would be great. Okay. So, uh, one thing that we can say about Aristotle's view on this, he thought there was like a continuum. 
with, with sweet at one end and bitter at the other. Um, he likens them to the colors, you know. We've got white at one end, black at the other end, and of course we've got gray, but he thought the other colors kind of fit in there as well. And, and he was attracted to this notion that you could maybe put them all together into the, the schema. And he noticed too with colors you had to kind of squish them together as well. He's like, well, we can't get seven because we've actually got eight or nine, but if we take yellow and we call that a kind of white, you know, or gray and we call that a kind of black, then maybe it all fits together. So there's a little bit of shoehorning in there as well. But for the most part, um, he's, he's uh, putting these, these together. He, he thinks that um, flavor plays a very important role in understanding what food does in our body. And now we might laugh a bit at, at some of these ideas that he had because they, they don't fit our natural science. It's, there's been a lot of advances since him. But if you think about what he's doing, it's quite interesting some of the ideas that he has. He thinks of taste as essentially a type of touch. He recognized that the tongue is, you know, has to be in contact with the things as opposed to odor where we're just sort of sniffing whatever happens out there. And um, he thinks of it as a lower sense. It's not as important, which is part of why he doesn't write much about it, unfortunately. Uh, sight, of course, is the best sense because it, it reveals things to us. Hearing is the second best. Smell is the third best because it works at a distance as well. And then you've got, you know, the body touching things and feeling things and the tongue, those are kind of lower. But he does uh, discuss them to some degree. He also realizes that, and he, he has a lot of discussion of this, there has to be some sort of liquid involved. We, we have to have some uh, vehicle. And he says this is not a medium like air is for sight or, or for sound. We have to have some way of, of turning things into liquid or we can't actually get them on our tongue and do anything with them. And he's got some interesting speculations about maybe this is why, for example, roasted nuts taste better when they're actually hot than when they're cold. He says um, maybe that's because the juice is flowing when they're hot and it's not flowing when they're cold and the juice is what we actually taste. So you see him speculating about this. Um, in the day anima, the on the soul, he also rejects Democritus's view that taste is just what we would call secondary qualities. He thinks that um, the taste really is out there in the thing. It's not just uh, a subjective impression that we have because of our particular way of, of being, our constitution. Um, he thinks that there really is sweetness in sweet things. And, and there's something to that, that view, I would say. Another thing that he talks about is the relationship between taste and nourishment. So you remember that continuum. I said there's sweet at one end and bitter at the other end, and then you've got all the other things in between. The sweet, he thought, is what is wholesome. It's, it, we, we find things sweet because they're actually good for us. And if you think about you know, before processed foods and the discovery of sugar cane and things like that, think about the ancient Greek world. Most of the things that actually were sweet or were at that, that end of things were pretty good for you. you know? um, some of them were, were, he says, a bit insipid, like bread. Bread's not really sweet because um, they didn't add a lot of sugar to things back then. But um, for the most part, things that are sweet are, are, are pretty good for you. Things that are bitter are usually bad for you. They don't have a lot of nutritive value. Um, now you could say, well, wait a second. What about you know, some of the things that we eat nowadays because they're good for us and they're bitter, like you know, uh, cruciferous vegetables? You know? um, well, okay, there, there's something to that. But they were eating enough good food that they didn't, they didn't have to supplement quite as much as, as we do back then. He thought that, that heat was involved in the process of digestion. This is kind of a common view in ancient Greek um, uh, medical literature, and it carried through to the modern age. And he thought that what the heat did is allowed extraction of what was wholesome, you know, what was sweet, and it left behind the bitter. Um, so you know, he talks about the fact that if you eat too much sweet stuff, it just sits in your stomach. And that's because it takes a while to, to digest all of that good stuff for you. Whereas if you round it out with what we nowadays call fiber, right, it's going to be much healthier for you. He also suggests that um, the other flavors should be used as seasoning. 
This goes back, one of the things I didn't mention um, with, with Hippocrates and uh, with some of the earlier thinkers was this notion that um, what's good for us is proportion. We need to have some sort of structure to what it is that we're putting together. So you've got these different tastes, and you put them together in the right way, it's going to be much better for us than if we're taking them straight, like what you're going to be doing right now, right? Uh, are we ready for it now? Or? OK, so we, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about Aristotle after we, we do the, uh, the tasting. So uh, I've got a whole script here. Uh, I'm very grateful for the preparation for this. I didn't do any of this. Andy and, and, and my kids did all of this work uh, for the stuff that you're getting. So the first thing we're going to do is, is sweet. For, for your tasting of sweet, we have uh, three things. We've got honey, uh, a fig cake, and a newer date. So these are not, yeah? So honey is the top level. Uh, the top level. Okay. Okay. Um, now the honey is straight sweet. This is the example that Aristotle used for, for what is sweet. Um, that goes all the way back to, to Homer. This is one that I knew about because of my, my interest in anger because uh, Homer represents anger as sweeter than honey from the comb. Uh, it's an old, old saying about that. So we've got the honey, we've got the fig, the fig cake, and a newer date. The newer date is... Um, a bit of a mixture, because it's not just sweet, it's also a savory thing, so it's mixing some of the other flavors together. Did you? Okay. Um, and later on in, in the talk, at the very end, we're also going to feature another sweet taste at the end of the lecture, using a single uh, a fresh flower that's, that's referred to as a dolce bud. And <clears throat> when you taste that, it's really quite interesting. So go ahead and taste the, whatever you like of the, the sweet stuff. Yeah, the honey or, or the, the, the date or uh, the, the fig. Um, you don't have to have it all if you don't want to, but um, I know I would. You know. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, there you go. I, it doesn't really flow that well. Uh, does anybody have, at, at, also, does anyone have any questions at this point while we're moving slowly through the tastes? Yeah. Did you ever talk about the connection between your sense of smell? Ah. Yes, he did, and some of the other thinkers following in his, in his trace did. They thought that taste was, in some respects, more primary than smell, which goes against some of what we tend to think. Like you plug your nose up or you have a cold, you can't really taste much of anything. Um, they were more interested in, in, in odors. They said, odors aren't really that, that describable compared to taste. Taste hits you like that. Odor, it's kind of faint. These guys also tasted a lot of stuff that we probably wouldn't put in our mouths, too. You know, like uh, myrrh, for example, right? Myrrh, it's nice for us to smell that. You don't want to put that in your mouth. It's very bitter. Um, but they, you know, they, they thought well, you should try it out. <laughs> so. Does he talk about how one taste would transform into another, like grape juice transforms Oh. Wine taste or? No. Wine and vinegar would be a, go ahead, yeah. He doesn't. Um, there's a lot of discussion of wine in ancient thinkers, and they're mostly interested in trying to classify the taste of it, rather than what transforms into what. It's, it's a big gap in his, his thinking, because why does vinegar have the taste? The vinegar is sort of the representative for them of sour. <clears throat> they didn't have a lot of the sour stuff that we have access to. So that was, you know, and, and that comes from wine, which is either sweet or, or maybe astringent or uh, maybe, maybe rough. You know, the austeron was, was a way of describing wine. Second thing that we have at the, the total other extreme, bitter. So for your tasting of, of bitter, we didn't want to overwhelm you with, with, you know, say, wormwood, which was one of the examples that they often used. Uh, we gave you kale instead. And the kale is not too bitter, so... Uh, you can, if you like kale, go ahead and try it. Um, I think all of you, if you don't like the kale, you know what bitter tastes like. Um, we're also going to have a bitter taste at the end of the lecture using a method for determining what's called super tasting. But, but Andy's going to handle that part of it as well. Oh, a super taster? Yeah, we've, we've got some, some cool stuff coming up. Um, now remember, Aristotle thought that the bitter was unwholesome. 
that it really had zero nutritive value at all. This is a common view that ran throughout um, not only the ancient period, but the Middle Ages. Uh, see some faces out there, and, and yeah, well, some people like kale. Some people, some people aren't so into it. I mean, you can think about coffee, bitter taste. Right? Some people like coffee straight or black. Others of us like I like it with milk. Um, some people like to put sugar in it to counterbalance that taste. Uh, let me see people shaking their head. They don't like coffee at all. Um, now the third one we have is oily. So. For that one, we've got olive oil, which is the, the example that they would use. Olives themselves would be in, in that taste. And um, you're not, unless you really want to just do it like a shot, I don't recommend that. Uh, we've got, we've got um, a bagel piece for you to dip in the olive oil as the, the, the vehicle for that. The ancients thought of bread as more or less tasteless. It was sort of a vehicle for, for other things. Um, of course, you could have you know, sweet breads or, or things like that. Um, you, could, you could change it. But for the most part, bread is pretty simple stuff. Um, Which is really, I just, that's hilarious, considering the, the ancient grains that they were using. Oh, yeah. It was unleavened, and then compared to our wonder bread. Oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. The ancient breads would have been just abounding with flavor comparatively. Yeah, but think about the other stuff that they're contrasting it to, like wine or olives, you know. What's the, what's the time frame now? It's BC. So Aristotle, we're talking about the 4th century, also Plato's extending into the 4th century, uh, BC, so the 300s. Okay, um, so people aren't even, aren't even killing each other over peppercorns yet. No, uh, not yet, but that's fairly soon, you know, because once the, once the, you know, sort of globalization, early globalization with the, with the Roman Empire and, and all the way to China, um, people are, are going to get crazy. I mean, there's, it's interesting, I, I wasn't going to talk about this literature at all, but there's a whole literature of, of people talking about, like, famous feasts and, how, you know, they, they would go into great debt to, to put on these spreads. There's a lot of discussion as well about how to behave yourself at dinner, you know, uh, among philosophers, among satirists. Yeah, because well, they, would, they would behave badly. So people thought you needed to, like, tell people, hey, don't try to steal the best food you know, off the plate as it comes by, let other people have some. Have you seen the book, Nathaniel's Nutmeg? No, I haven't. It's the Dutch basically had their island with nutmeg. Yeah. And cut all the plants down otherwise, and there's chapters just on the part where people that didn't say well. Oh, wow. So it's, it got to the point where a little spice went a long way. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing the, the, the extents that people will go to for... For taste, and this is you know, I think there's a gap in a lot of philosophy not taking taste very seriously, um, and taking food as seriously. They thought it was kind of that'll take care of itself. That's that's kind of a minor thing. If we're going to think about human beings, let's think about politics instead, or you know, the city, or you know, things like that. Uh, food is very important. Uh, the next taste that we have is salty. Uh, so for your tasting of salty, uh, we'd, like to, we'd like you to add some of the kosher salt to your olive oil. Or if you want to take it, some of it straight, you can do that. But that's, that's pretty salty by itself. Um, and then use the other bagel piece to taste the difference in taste with the addition of the salt. It's a common way to, to jazz up your olive oil, you know, put a bit of salt in it. I, I like to do that myself. Yeah, with, I can't read that. The olives are also a way to add some salt. Oh, okay, yeah, so the olives. Uh, okay. So while, while you're doing that, um, let me tell you a little bit more about, about Aristotle and his, his views. So like I mentioned, he, he thought, as did a lot of the ancients, that proportion was very important. Um, you don't want to have tastes just by themselves. 
because that's a little bit overwhelming. It's also you know, potentially hazardous to you. So he talks about this. He says, um, things are, are pleasant when brought pure and unmixed into the proportion. So you, you have some sort of conception of what you're working with. You try to get your ingredients as unmixed as possible, and then you mix them together into some sort of composition. Much like the way that we think about painters, you know, they don't uh, mix all their paints together in one big mess at the start. You know, they're separate in different tubes, and then they, they decide what they're going to do with it. Same thing with, with music. You know, you want your... Uh, your horn to be a pure sound, you want your lyre to be a pure sound, and then you bring them together. So, All right, so the next taste that we're going to do is what the Greeks called uh, drimu, or pungent. And this covers a lot of ground. So garlic is an example of that. You know, think about things that go up your nose and, and make your eyes water a bit. Horseradish would be an example. Um, we have peppercorn and sweet and tangy mustard. So of course, sweet and tangy mustard is a little bit of sweet and, and uh, sour in there. So uh, feel free to try the peppercorn. Yeah, what, what is it? I'm sorry, I can't hear. Oh, OK, so you, yeah, use the pretzel squares to sample the mustard. Um, yeah. So now think about this. We, we don't recognize that as one of the four tastes. Right? Sweet, sour, salty, bitter. Um, you could make an argument that what we're tasting there is not really directly a taste. Uh, that it rather it's, it's a different effect on the tongue and then it has to do with what's actually going up our nose. Um, People will make, make arguments like that. The Greeks thought this is something distinctive. This is not reducible just to sweet, sour, salty, or bitter. This is something that we have to recognize for its own sake. You also see this in Chinese and in Indian uh, cuisine as well. These being recognized as separate categories. So um, kind of a cross-cultural perspective. Now, the other thing that we've got coming up that isn't there in, <clears throat> in the four tastes as well is the astringent. Um, this is something that Aristotle talks quite a bit about. He seems to be very interested in the astringent in the physical problems. I'm not quite sure why he was interested in that taste and not very interested in the other ones, but he, he was. So if we were doing this lecture later in the season, we'd offer you actual pomegranate seeds. Astringent is what makes you pucker up. It's not sour as such. Remember those old cartoons you know, with Bugs Bunny or, or uh, Wile E. Coyote, and there was alum? And you know somebody would eat alum, and then like their face would scrunch up, and they wouldn't have a mouth left. So that's an extreme of astringent. Um, acorns were an example of that. You know, roast acorns, and you eat it, it's got that that sort of makes you pucker kind of taste. People use this nowadays in candy to to uh, you know for the kids to make certain kinds of candy uh, much more tasty. Sweet tarts have an astringency to them. It's not just sour and sweet, it's also astringency. So what we have for you is, is cranberry pomegranate juice. That's pretty straight astringent. Uh, cranberry juice by itself is rather astringent. And then we've got chocolate covered uh, uh, pomegranate. Um, that's more sweet. I, 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 I don't know, when I was tasting them, I, I tasted more chocolate in some of them and more pomegranate in others. But you, you can try it out for yourself. And we're going to have a, a slightly astringent, but also somewhat different taste towards the end, uh, a numbing taste. This is, this is something that isn't in the, the eight tastes as such, but is, is kind of interesting to do. For me, it actually, well, I won't tell you what it tastes like, because I, I don't want to uh, uh, skew anybody, but I'll tell you afterwards. Uh, we've got what's called the Szechuan button at the end that you'll try, if, if you're up to it. And uh, that will be a numbing as well as a stringent taste. The other thing that we have that's not recognized in the four tastes, the last of them, is what the Greeks called austeron. And like I pointed out, we get the word austere from that. It goes straight into Latin <clears throat> from the Greek, austerum. And it gets used in talking about um, speeches, like Aristotle talks about styles when you're talking, public speaking, being very dry, you know, a dry speaker. Um, not exactly the same thing as boring, but you're like, yeah. This is kind of rough, uh, not really getting a lot of pleasure out of it. Um, dry wine is an example of that. And I think that we can associate this with, with tannin, which oftentimes people want to say is just 
bitterness, but really there's something uh, different between the, the, what's going on in canon and what's going on in, like if you actually tried wormwood, wormwood's pretty bad, uh, or, or you know other bitter medicines. And for that, what we have is raw shelled walnuts. So of course, anybody with a nut allergy, um, bad idea. And then we've got unsweetened black Assam tea. Um, straight tea by itself, not, not uh, great for a lot of people. You know, another thing people like to put milk or sugar or honey into, even lemon. Lemon has sweetness to it besides sourness. Um, so that's, that's why people do that. And then the last taste that we've got is one that you recognize, uh, which is sour. Um, so for sour taste, we might expect things like lemon. Um, we're focusing on vinegar in part because the Greeks didn't, didn't use, you know, I mean, nowadays, Greeks use lemon in, in a lot of cooking, right? But back then, uh, the most sour thing that, that gets, gets talked about in all this literature is vinegar because it was, it was all over the place. They'd use it for seasoning. Um, so we've got some vinegar potato chips. You know, we're blessed in having a million different flavors of potato chips these days, yeah? Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And at, at the end, we're going to do a, a sour to sweet taste experiment um, using a supplement derived from what's called a miracle berry. Uh, and we'll use a lemon wedge and a tangerine half that you've got there in that tasting. So don't eat them up right now. Um, but, you know. And we have palate cleansers, too, if people need them. Don't we? Or, or just the water? Okay, just the water. Okay. So while you're finishing up at that, I'll tell you just a few other things about Aristotle and then we'll, we'll run through some of the other history. Um, one of the things that Aristotle talks about quite a bit is this common experience of people differing or being off about, about taste. So they, they knew that people who were ill, this is a common example, people who are ill taste things differently, things taste bitter to them that are actually sweet or, or other uh, flavors. In uh, the De Sensu, Aristotle says that there are some people who are much more discriminating in their sense of taste. Nowadays, we often call them you know, super tasters or we talk about people developing their palate. In the Problemata, he has an example of drinking wine after eating rotten fruit. I'm not sure why people were eating rotten fruit back then, but he talks about that. He says, well, people eat the rotten fruit and the wine tastes bitter. And the reason why it tastes bitter is because they've got the bitterness already on their tongue. And then when they're adding the wine, you've got more liquid. And so the wine itself is being, you might say, corrupted by that. Yeah, Jesse, you had, you had a question? Um, what do the walnuts represent? Oh, uh, the not the astringent, the rough, the 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 uh, uh, austerone. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, he also talks, like I mentioned, if you if you eat astringent food, like uh, he gives the example of acorns or myrtle berries. Uh, I, I've never had a myrtle berry myself. Um, I'm not even sure what they would look like but I guess this is com a common thing to eat back then, uh, it'll make the wine taste sweeter. And like I said, you see this with sweet tarts, except they're not you know, first one, then the other. They just put them together in the candy. The astringency makes the sweetness come out. Uh, sort of like you know, when we're contrasting clothes, right? Wear uh, a blue jacket and an orange shirt. There's, the orange is going to pop more uh, as opposed to, say, a gray shirt. You know. Um, the other thing that he talks about that I think is kind of interesting is in the De Anima, and this is the thing that I was supposed to be researching in the first place that got me interested in this whole thing, was how uh, the senses are brought together through what he calls the common sense uh, or the common sensibles. You know, when we, when we see things, do we see them and uh, know that they're going to be sour, not just because we've already associated that in our head while lemons are sour, stuff like that. Can we look at things and tell whether they're going to be of a certain taste or not. Um, Aristotle thinks that we can. Uh, and Andy used to do a very interesting experiment with her, her students where they would play a, a bit of music and try to associate that with a flavor profile. The, there's a lot of sort of what we call synesthetic perception. I, and when I say synesthesia, I don't mean the disorder that some people have where they're, you know, seeing, they're seeing uh, flavors or, or, you know, tasting colors or things like that. I mean what we normally do, which is to see, you know, the, the whiteness of the paper and know that this is soft without actually touching it. There's things like that that we can do with, with taste as well that Aristotle thought. 
So um, while you nosh on, on you know, other stuff at, at your leisure, let me tell you about these, how, how this played out in later times. So there are a lot of people who write about this, and, and I've got a number of them listed here, but I'm not going to um, necessarily bring all of them up because I want to stay on track. Um, what I will say is that throughout the Middle Ages, uh, throughout the, the earlier period, the ancient period leading into the Middle Ages, and even into the modern period, there wasn't a lot of attention coming to this in any written way by people who were primarily interested in culinary arts. That's going to be a later development, unfortunately, because I, I would love to know what the monks who had gardens were doing with this knowledge of the tastes or what was going on in you know, royal kitchens as far as these tastes. Most of the sources that we have are, are philosophers, theologians, uh, medical writers. Um, some of them do actually engage in, in some, some cookbook stuff, but it's mostly in terms of medicine. So um, Aristotle had a friend named Theophrastus. Theophrastus will take over Aristotle's school after Aristotle dies. We don't have everything that, that uh, Theophrastus wrote, unfortunately. One of the losses that's really unfortunate is Theophrastus actually wrote a book about tastes or about flavors. That's gone. Uh, we, I was just talking uh, with Scott about this before the, the presentation, that we probably have, uh, you know, es estimating conservatively, maybe a fifth of what was written in the ancient world in philosophy. We have these, these lists of all these books that we don't have anymore. Um, and so unfortunately, we don't have that. Er uh, Theophrastus did discuss a lot of other things, though. So if you're interested in this uh, topic, he's got books like um, The Causes of Plants or The Inquiry into Plants. Why, why plants are important? Well, because plants taste like things and you use them in medicine. Uh, he has a book on odors where he also discusses taste. And so he, he ends up uh, basically talking about seven tastes, although you know um, he's working off of Aristotle, so it's really eight tastes. Galen, uh, you may have heard of him. He was a, another ancient medical writer. Um, he's kind of eclectic. He's bringing things in from, from everybody. And he discusses tastes and previous thinkers' classifications. He tends to use Plato's seven tastes, but he changes the wording, and then sometimes adds in, depending on the work, other flavors, sometimes assimilates flavors to each other. So there's already some variance going on. Uh, another guy, Nemesius, in his uh, De Natura Hominis, draws on Aristotle and Galen, discusses the eight tastes. This would be in the fourth century and fifth century. Um, John Philoponus, again in the uh, fifth, sixth century, he writes a commentary. What's that? B.C. or A.D.? A.D. All this is A.D. at this point. He, um, he, he writes a commentary on Aristotle, and this became a thing to do. Aristotle was an important writer, so if you write a commentary on, the, on Aristotle's book where he discusses the eight tastes, you've got to discuss it. And what's important about Philoponus is he gives us examples. Because some of these are hard to relate to. What, what is austerone, you know? Uh, well, he's the one who tells us dry wine. That's, that's the taste of it. Um, you know, some of their no-brainers, honey is sweet, uh, olive oil is oily, you know, but he, he's, he's useful for telling us about other things, and he does, in fact, talk about pepper. He uses pepper as the example by then, but by now, you know, we've got trade, trade long established. Um, John Damascene. Where does pepper fit in? Where would pepper be classified? That would be uh, in that um, uh, spicy or, or uh, pungent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be the, what the Greeks are calling the dreamo. Um, John Damaskin, like I mentioned, he talks about these. Uh, then there's this guy who is a, we don't know anything about him, uh, his biography. Uh, his name is Ibn Sayer al Warraq, and he writes a very famous cookbook. Um, and it's got 132 chapters, and he discusses the eight tastes, and he correlates them to traditional cooking uh, using recipes that are coming from the Baghdad of his time. So Baghdad was a really important city. Um, a lot of the, the, the caliphs, their courts were at Baghdad. Lots of you know, uh, cooking going on at the court. Lots of other people living around there cooking things. He, he want, he's interested in, in health. And in, you know, if you're ailing in this way, you need to eat this kind of dish because it's got these tastes going on. Another important uh, Muslim thinker, Avicenna, um, he um, 
He's commenting on, on Aristotle to some degree, but he, he also discusses uh, drugs. He was, a, he was a doctor himself, and he works in terms of these elements and principles, and he talks in terms of the eight tastes. He actually discusses um, what these tastes are supposed to do medically. So he'll say that the bitter is good for cleansing and coarsening. The rough is good for whatever squeezing is. I'm not quite sure what that means. I still have to do more research on that. The, the oily... Soothing, makes sense, right? Uh, and in he adhesion. Pungency, dissolving and diluting. A and so on and so forth. He becomes, yeah. When were these two, Ibn and the other gentleman, when were they writing? So uh, where Rock is in the 900s, and then Avicenna is um, writing in the early, um, well, after the, the beginning of the, the new millennium. Uh, he, he dies in 1037. Um, then we get another, another person, Vincent of Beauvais. Now we're back to the, to the West. He writes a book called The Speculum Maius, which is sort of like a uh, natural history, we would call it. Right? He's trying to make sense of the whole world. He's read Avicenna. He talks about the eight tastes in terms of waters and the kinds of waters that you might encounter and how to fix them if they're unhealthy for you by adding certain things to them, which would alter their quality. So you notice everybody's using the eight tastes at this time. It's not a, a reference just to the fortes. Um, there's a number of other people, Thomas Aquinas, a uh, big you know, medieval thinker that, that a lot of people know for other reasons. He comments on Aristotle's De Anima. Um, he actually thought that we could, again, squish these tastes together uh, because he's commenting on the dissensu where Aristotle's doing that. So he, he says, well, really the, the astringent and the, and the pungent are the same thing. That's kind of a stretch. I, I don't really buy that, uh, but, but he, he thought that. He also thought that we could correlate it to these, these humors and the dry and the wet and the hot and the cold. Yeah. Could he be maybe the godfather of our, of our four? Was he the original? Oh, Thomas? No. Compressor? No, because uh, he, he recognized, he, I mean, he still got seven, right? And, and there are other people, like Galen. Galen will depending on what book, he'll, he'll blend them together or he'll say, really, these two are... Like he, Galen thinks that the, um, the astringent and the dry or the, the austere are really the same thing, just varying in uh, degree. You know? So it, it's, it's, a good, it's an important question, though. This is something that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Is, is there a, a, a fundamental difference in, in just degree or is it a different what we call modality? Right. You know, right. um, so if, if it's a totally different taste, it's a different modality. Yeah. How can they end up taking the entire range of spices in the world and drinking at one taste? Well, they didn't. Because here we got it. Basically, when you look at this, it's spicy. Yeah, cinnamon would be sweet. So um, other other spices, some are bitter, some some are more dry. Um, They'd be all over. Yeah, you would just you would have to actually. Some of them would be mixed too, you know. Um, they wouldn't. What's that? Paprika. Yeah. Paprika. So. That's the that be sweet <laughs> yeah, I mean smoked paprika. Yeah. It, yeah, it really depends. It just seems to me that that's a very. You know, it seems like you get oh. more than some categories of all Well, it's not that everything is a pure thing in each category. So you, you could have, uh, you could have like maybe something has got a lot of bitterness and a bit of astringency and a bit of sweetness. Um, these are sort of, think of it as sort of like the, the scale of musical notes, right? You can make lots and lots of chords. Um, and the chords are very different from each other. Um, but they still boil down to the same basic array. Although, you know, we, we, do, we also do have uh, interesting scales of music where, like, they've got the quarter tones, right? You know, or Indian music has other tones, so, so maybe that's, that's not a good example. Um, there's some other people that, that start to, we get into the Renaissance. This guy, uh, Gasparro Contarini, he's an alchemist. He's also a, a church official. He, he suggests that there's eight basic flavors, but then he says, you know, uh, we could probably make up new ones because cooking changes them and adds new things uh, that aren't already there. Uh, Jean-Francois Fernel, who coins the term physiology,
biology. He's the, he's the guy who starts suggesting that taste buds are sensitive to fat, something that scientists poo-pooed for a long time and are now starting to take seriously again as a possibility. Um, that would be, th those guys would be, you know, 1400s, 1500s. Uh, Thomas Willis, uh, this would be the 1600s. He's an English physician. He proposes nine basic tastes. Uh, another very influential guy, Nehemiah Gru, who's a physician and botanist, said there's at least 16 simple tastes that could maintain their unique qualities. So now we're starting to see more differentiation, right? And um, he says, for example, horseradish is, is ochreous, which he thought of as, as pungent and hot at the same time. Um, there's a guy, John Floyer, who writes a treatise on asthma, who discusses the, the, the flavors and how they could contribute to um, having better health in terms of uh, getting over asthma, which was a big problem, I guess, at the time. Uh, Carolus Linnaeus, who you guys know from you know, botany, he discusses the tastes as well. He says there's nine tastes, and then he later on adds in, and I'm not quite sure what these are supposed to be, uh, aqueous, okay, watery in some sense, and and then nauseous, tastes that make us like <laughs> want to puke, right? Um, I, I don't know exactly what that flavor profile would be like, but you probably would. You pro here, this, what's that? Is it not this mix? Uh, uh, yeah. We don't need to try that one. We saved that one for later. <laughs> um, and then there's other people, too, that are, that are doing this. And then we get this guy who's, who's really important for gastronomy because he's one of the fathers of the, the discipline, uh, Jean Briat Severin. And he writes a book called The Physiology of Taste in the Early 19th Century. And he doesn't think there's four tastes. He thinks there's an infinity of flavors that we can't possibly categorize them. So then the question that we're left with is, well, wh where did we get four tastes from? And if we want to understand that, we have to think about sort of what was going on in the mid-19th century and early 20th century in terms of, you know, apply science to everything. But it was a rather reductive understanding of science. Um, there was sort of an intersection of, of anatomy and, and chemistry and culinary arts and, uh, and sciences. And psychology is developing as a discipline apart from philosophy where it originally had its home. Aristotle's De Anima is on the soul, the, on, on the psuche, psychology. Um, they start to like to really measure things. And measuring is great. Um, I, I'm all for it. But, but sometimes you wind up only measuring certain things and leaving out the rest. So this notion that only what is measurable with what we can measure uh, right now can, can sometimes be a bit stultifying. Uh, they start to narrow what's understood as flavor or taste to what would be um, chemically reproducible. It, or, or in terms of the modalities of sensation. And they start stripping away these tastes. So the, maybe the astringent can just be reduced to the bitter. Right? Or maybe the uh, dryness of tannin, maybe that's just a form of bitterness or sourness or, or, or whatever. Um, there's a lot of controversies between these researchers about um, whether these are distinct flavors in terms of qualities or in terms of what they call modalities. And you might say, well, what, what's the, why, why care about that? If they're just qualities, then they could be in some way reduced to each other. If they're modalities, then they're irreducible. Um, but they were also saying, look, some of the things that we consider taste are not actually modalities of taste. They're modalities of other things. So think about pungentness, right? If, if it, what's going on is your nose is acting in a certain way, that's not really taste. So they're pushing that aside. And um, in 1927, we get this guy, Hans Hennig, and he comes up with the four-taste tetrahedron, which, which you might have seen. Um, they're really interested in, in identifying the chemical constituents, receptor sites, and mechanisms. And then we get um, this guy, Boring, uh, who wasn't really boring, but he, he <laughs> made a mistake. He, he, in, his, in the 40s, he misinterpreted Hennig's research, which had to do with relative sensitivity of the tongue. He's the guy we got the tongue chart from. <laughs> He's the reason why we think that sweet only happens here, uh, when sweet is actually diffused across the entire tongue. What's his name again? The, the guy who made the mistake or the guy who, uh, boring, <laughs> B-O-R-I-N-G. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just like it's, you know. Perfect. Yeah. Spelled the same way, too. Yeah. But so what, what's going on is, is they are engaging in something that makes sense scientifically. But they're, they're 
eventually leaving out what we would call the phenomenological perspective, how things actually do appear to us, how we live them up. And now you notice that what's, what's going on in recent years is there's been kind of a swing to the other extreme. So it took a long time before this, you guys are all familiar with the umami taste, which we don't actually have a, a thing for here, and isn't represented, I think, in the taste, unless maybe oily is kind of like it. Um, the umami thing is um, that, that the thing that mushrooms give us, that beef gives us, that uh, you know, uh, uh, good foamed at the bottom of a pan gives us. It's kind of a how would you describe it? It's kind of an overall wholesome taste to yeah, it. Yeah, it gets on all senses and it seems older than it is. Yeah. Really, I mean, that's why we love mushrooms. There's more depth to it. That's why sucky wine is sucky and a really great wine is really great. <laughs> yeah. So it, it took a long time for people to say, yeah, there, there could be a possibility of this because that four taste orthodoxy was so strong. Now researchers are, are saying, yeah, maybe fat is actually tasted by the tongue. That would be what Aristotle called the oily taste, right? Um, spiciness or piquance is something they talk about. That's similar to the, the, the you know, the uh, pungent, although not perhaps exactly the same. People also talk in terms of, and this is not in the eight taste, but metallic taste. Um, we do taste metal. Right? I mean, put your tongue on, don't do it when it's cold, of course, but put your tongue on, on a piece of metal, uh, and it does have a distinct taste. Um, coolness, what, what mint gives us when we, when we eat mint. Um, carbon dioxide, it's turning out that we, we sense, you know, that's why we like uh, carbonated beverages. And so there could potentially be a lot of others. If we're only thinking in terms of taste receptors, then maybe on the tongue, maybe there are only five. Um, but what goes into taste is a lot more than just what happens in the tongue. It's about the mouth feel. It's about what goes on with our nasal passages. It what, it's what goes on with a lot of other things. So I'm, I'm not actually advocating that we should try to return to the eight tastes of Aristotle any more than I would say that you know we have to use all, all the rest of Aristotle's natural science because um, that would be a catastrophe. But I, I want to. The whole reason I wanted to talk about this was because I think it's very interesting that there's this entire tradition spanning most of our history here in the West of recognizing an entire multiplicity of tastes that got left out, which now we're gradually starting to reincorporate. So that's, that's pretty much the end of my gastronomical stuff. And I think we could do some Q&A, and then Andy's got some cool stuff for you coming up, and I'll let her actually take over at that point. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wasn't talking about is pepper. Pepper huge span from probably sweet to extreme. Yeah, you mean like, uh, not peppercorn, but, but like uh, green peppers through, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Uh, peppers that are used to yeah, I mean the hot peppers would be, would be in the realm of what the Greeks are recognizing as the pungent. Sweet peppers would be sweet. Um, and then you could have anything in between. When we, when we smoke, like smoke paprika, um, we're adding a, a different taste to it, which I don't think they, they really had in that schema. Um, yeah, that's a good question, yeah. One, one question I was thinking about when you were describing uh, some of the things you were talking about is when did, um, just kind of curious, when did science and food uh, take off the, the study of the, the healthiness of oh. food products really became a big deal? I don't know what era. Yeah. There's there's really no one single time because the medical writers were interested in food from the beginning and ancient medicine. Um, I mean, it didn't have a hell of a lot to work with besides what you ate and what you did for exercise. Surgery was not developed. You know, they had an array of drugs that they would use. But a lot, like Hippocrates is, is a huge advocate of eating the right sort of things and you're going to be healthy. Now, whether that's scientific from our current perspective, it's not really very much. I mean, there was some empirical analysis, but there, it's not like they were doing you know, double-blind studies or anything <laughs> like that, right? Um, but um, so it's like a continuum. As time goes on, 
There's more and more and more of it. The Islamic world was, uh, you know, uh, in, in the Middle Ages was where a lot of that was taking place. They were they were very far advanced compared to us over here in the West as far as uh, what what diet did to our bodies. Um, there's a whole story that can be told there about why why that that um, you know went into to decline. Um, but so yeah, there's if we want like hard science where people are publishing things in journals, the 19th, 20th century, yeah. You have much in your research more in the ancient realm of the Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic kind of say. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they equate food as medicine. Yeah. And did centuries before, I would even say, well, maybe at the same time the Greeks did, but in a more profound way. And so created a system for it, but I don't know how much of it was written down. Yeah. I mean, we know that there's that going on. We also know that the, the uh, Islamic um, researchers talking about the Aetes influenced Indian stuff. Mm -hmm. So Avicenna, for example, gets read quite a bit in India in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages yeah. um, but there's already yeah, a native sort of tradition of that going on. And I, I don't do much with that myself because um, in part, you know, my, my research tool languages are Greek, Latin, French, German, and then English, yeah. right? I don't, I can't read uh, Sanskrit, Sanskrit or, is a light. <laughs> or Arabic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, but it yeah. makes sense because the doshas were established like second century. Yeah. Time there's any evidence of them being qualified. You know, I, and again, it, it's so unfortunate that we don't have uh, written documents, although we could discover them. Um, because we know that there was a lot of cultural interchange. Once Alexander the Great right. had this conquest and the Bactrian kingdoms are established, this is like, you know, uh, fourth century BC, India as a cultural, um, as, as a civilization, and the West were brought into contact, and a lot of things start flowing back and forth. Um, but we don't, we don't really know, yeah. you know, when it comes to that. Yeah. And then there's China, too, you know. Um, there's, a, there's an, I mean, the five elements uh, philosophy goes back very far. There's five tastes associated with that. Um, yeah. Any, yeah, go ahead. You know that uh, Pythagoras didn't like the beans? Yeah. So, is that that or the There's a lot of theories why the Pythagoreans didn't eat beans, and we don't really know. Whether any of them are actually accurate? It should be a t-shirt, though. <laughs> I mean, it's probably, in some ways, good advice, you know, some of the time. Don't eat a lot of beans, right? Um, but, you know, th actually, the Pythagoreans are one of the things that is, is strangely absent in this. So in ancient philosophy, right, and, and ancient um, thought in general, you have these schools of, of philosophers. And the Pythagoreans were a school founded by Pythagoras, the guy that we get the Pythagorean theorem from, probably, or maybe one of his, his friends, because they attribute everything good to him. And they were all about number. They were all about order. You would think that they probably had something to say about taste. We don't have any of that, unfortunately. It's one of those losses. And we don't see anybody else referring back to them and saying that they contributed in some way to this. So. It's too bad. I, 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 you know, I would love to see so much of ancient literature that we've lost be available to us because then we pour through it. You, you had a question, too. I, as, this is the best word question as I drink out my wonderful aquafina. What's the taste of water? Yeah. Um, back, say, I mean, if you get back to the story of the crucifixion with the vinegar. Oh, yeah. Um, Sour wine, yeah. I, I'm, I'm taking... Even just the things people would drink day to day to be healthy, I would guess would have a bit of a sour taste. Well, because yeah, from I'm getting I get mixed people mixed answers from people that know a lot more than I do, which isn't hard. Yeah, but um, me too. <laughs> that the the water wasn't really good, and so it was either oh. like some sort of wine or beer or even vinegar, which would all not taste like water. Did yeah, I mean, it, 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 into the, the tastes. Yes. I mean, a lot of people drank water in ancient Greece. Um, more, I think, in the Middle Ages was like you just wouldn't drink water if you could help it. Um, and it, it varied from area to, to area. Um, the, um, the wines, like I was talking about, there were a lot of discussions of this wine tastes this way, this wine tastes this way. We've got a lot of that. We don't have a lot of... Other things, uh, they were mostly interested in their, their wine drinking in the Roman world, you know. 
Um, that and fish sauce. They really love the fish sauces. Yeah, there wasn't any discussion on the fishy taste. Yeah, well, um, I think they'd probably put that in with oily, you know? Yeah. But you're right. I mean, that, that, that is a, a lack. We talked about the smoky taste, too. Is, I mean, we know they smoke things. Yeah, I guess. Um, I mean, it's a, we don't, we don't, they weren't in that, they weren't necessarily in sushi, so the fish would have been cooked, or sashimi, though. Really. Yeah, yeah. In some manner, probably smoked for preservation, salted, certainly. Yeah. And smoked or seasoned in some way that we can't imagine. Um, unripe grape juice was used also as a both preservative and as a sour aspect. Yeah, that would make there sense. There were a lot of marinades, and it goes way back to antiquity. Yeah. Um, and grapes were wild and everywhere and used by poor and wealthy alike. Yeah, you know, the astringent taste, too, um, a lot of the ancient authors will talk about um, unripe fruit as being astringent. Not grapes, but like uh, pears, uh, quince, uh, things like that. Um, and if you, get a, if you get a quince today, I actually was hoping we could use quince for this, but we couldn't find any uh, on, on, on the market easily that would be not quite ripe. That is really, that really makes your mouth pucker up. It's like, it's like, uh, almost like eating a sweet tart. Well, it's not that long ago. I mean, if you look at books on the menu they had on the Titanic, mm. some of the chips, and you look at, what are they mixing together? <laughs> God, this is, this, yeah. there's there wow. taste even 100 years ago that we wouldn't do today, probably. Yeah, and there were a lot of people eating a lot of food back then, like having a steak with, with you know, all sorts of other things on top of it for breakfast, and you see <laughs> people writing about that in um, uh, discussions of, like, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, like, city eating. Uh, are, you, are you getting ready for the, the other thing? Well, I'll take whatever other questions we... Oh, did you have a question, or...? Ah. Now the hot peppers, those are a new world. Uh, well, they have new world origins. So okay. Use, not really. You can't really go back to these classical authorities to find out what their opinion. Well, they didn't say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They they talked about things like um, uh, garlic, for example. You know, they they didn't use hot peppers as an yeah, example. They about but that's about it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, think about all the stuff that was coming in, you know. Yeah, we sprinkle salt and pepper in the scrambled eggs and don't even think about it. But imagine how much that changed. Yeah. We could do that. <laughs> <laughs> there's the taste of scrambled eggs. Yeah. <laughs> there, you know, there's a famous uh, story, and I don't remember where it comes up. Uh, it's around the French Revolution, and there's this aristocrat, and he's trying to get out of Paris, and he's, um, he's in disguise, so he's, you know, he's you know, made himself look like a peasant. And he goes into an inn and he says, uh, you know, do you want anything for breakfast? Yeah, I'll have an omelet. And omelets were kind of common back then. And they asked the guy, uh, fine, how many eggs? Because I guess that was the common thing to do. He says, well, about a dozen. Because <laughs> that was what he was used to eating. You know, now, of course, they realized immediately and then he was guillotined. So, you know. Too much salt. <laughs> yeah, he didn't ask for the salt. Did you? Uh, are you ready? Or are there any other questions? Yeah. yeah. One more comment is I'm sort of observing this that it seems like what makes food pleasant to and we enjoy in tasting it yeah. is combining. Yes. Foods. And I think today we probably combine things differently than we say we did on the Titanic and yeah. go back farther and it was even different. Plus, different cultures. We just got back from Morocco. They don't put salt and pepper on their eggs. They put cumin on their eggs. Oh, okay. So, I mean, it, it, cultures are different too. Yeah. And the combining of the flavors is what makes it interesting and what people like, I, I think. I think yeah. It's from the Romans, actually. Because Roman, Roman legions, when they brought like their garden to flavor their own food wherever they went, and cumin was their favorite. Oh, really? Yeah, cumin goes back a long ways in the West. <laughs> 
I, you know, I remember when I was a kid, and this just shows how, I, I grew up here in Wisconsin, and in the 70s, I remember I was in fourth grade, and there was a kid who, uh, their, their parents, they were having a birthday party, and it was the first time that I had tacos. And what tacos were back then were um, that, that Ortega mix hard that you'd get, shell. yeah, exactly. And then the hard shell tacos. Yeah. And we never had anything like that. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so great, you know? <laughs> and then of course, everybody on the street had to have tacos. And it was like, you know, a thing. But the tacos that we were having were, were you know, those weren't real tacos, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but it was such a, you know, I, and it's not as if what we were eating was bland. It just didn't have that thing in it. And, and there's so much that gets contributed. Now I think, unfortunately, we've kind of swung to the other extreme where we have uh, so much of industry trying to combine a million different things together and, and, and uh, uh, it might be better for us to, to get away from some of the su super abundance of, of choice. I'd like but. Aristotle to, to graph out a cool ranch burrito. <laughs> <laughs> and see where he would put it. <laughs> you know, I think that yeah, that's one tough. Of the problems we have is that now chemically some of these flavors can be reproduced oh, yeah. with chemicals yeah. now, rather than natural ingredients. And I think that's where we're running into the problem. That was something they were really interested in in the early 20th century. How could you, um, and war gave an impetus to this in particular, because you were cut off from access to, say, vanilla, right? So how do you, how do you make vanilla artificially, right? And so it, it spawned this entire industry of things that could supplement, and there's a lot of different uh, artificial flavors out there. So that, that, that's a good, or did you have another question? I was wondering what the, uh, the Romans put dinner on a lot of what they ate. I'm wondering how that figures out with their attitude towards the taste because oh. my understanding is first it has a kind of a flavor. You mean the fish sauce? The fish sauce, which is, it's, yeah. It's, it's uh, decomposed fish, basically. Well, and some other, yeah. So it's, that, yeah. And it's extremely, extremely salty to the point that yeah. it's unpalatable to modern taste. And I've heard that one of the reasons that might be so is because they use lead in the cookware and people who ate from Oh. The eating from that, they lost their taste or salt. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that particular thing. I can tell you this: that the Romans had a massive problem with lead because they used it in their pipes too, um, and so it was in the baths. It was in all the other running water that they had. They used it in cookware. Um, like mm -hmm. yeah. They called tomatoes the devil's fruit. Oh, but that's in the. That's like later on. That's yeah. <laughs> because I was still lead. Yeah. Oh. The chemical, the chemical leaves still lead. Oh, interesting. Citrus and lead. Sure. Okay. Coffee and cigarettes, they go together beautifully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what makes it so tough to quit when you're a smoker. You know? But, I mean, so, so they, yeah, I mean, they, you could say that they made everything much more salty by, by using this fish sauce, but they didn't use it on everything. You know, I mean, we, we've got records of Roman meals where, like, they loved to do all sorts of variety when it was possible. Um, but yeah, they certainly did use a lot of it. Well, uh, at, at the level that they're supposed <coughs> to be, either they had a much greater tolerance of salt than modern people would, or they just couldn't taste it. I think it's more like, um, you know how you got some people who put ketchup on everything? Yeah. And other people who don't, like the rest of us, you know. And it's that way, we, we, I don't get the impression from at least what I've read in, in uh, Roman literature that fish sauce is going on everything for most people. I mean, that wouldn't, you'd have to have a ton of fish sauce to make that possible. Um, and, you know, we read about these great feasts that they had, and they'll describe in pretty great detail about what's, what's being set before them, um, I think a lot of that's, you know, in, involved in trying to like show what a big shot you were to have a lot of different. Yeah, they were all dead at 34 anyway, right? So it's a little salt. Yeah, I mean, they didn't know that they didn't know that sodium in high quantities wasn't good for us, but they didn't know a lot of. I mean, they didn't know lead wasn't good for us either, right? So, uh, but you know, we didn't know that much about it either. Like lead paint when even just my generation was was a kid. So, well, let's should we do the. Uh, uh, other components then. Thanks for, for uh, your attention. It's a very long story, so really, really great questions. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Andy, who's going to lead you through all sorts of other interesting culinary things.